morning. If you're not in here, come on in. We're going to start start our church service. We're going to be uh, singing glory to his name. Uh, the thing about this morning, a, a verse came to my mind. Uh, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And uh, that came to my name, came to my mind because I saw this, this woman online. Her name is Rejoice. Her first name is Rejoice. And I thought, how amazing. She is reminded every day to just rejoice in what God has given her and to be thankful. So we're going we're gonna to sing uh, Down at the Cross. Glory to his name. Down at the cross where my Savior died. Bye. 
by the glorious power of the Father. Now we also may live new lives. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead, and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. Sin is no longer your master, for you now no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. And it just made me think of the people in my life who have loved me unconditionally. Do you guys have people like that in your life that just that love you enough to let you be free to make your own choices? That uh, love you unconditionally no matter what you say or what you do. They don't care how you feel. They still love you. Um, when someone cares about everything you do, like every detail of your life, but they don't boss you about it. They don't condemn you. They don't tell you what you should be doing. Um, and I just think, you know, when someone treats you like that, you want to spend every moment with them. 
you know? I mean, I know I, know I do. Um, and the more you know God, the more you know that that's who he is. That's his heart. His heart is um, love. And I just brought to mind Ephesians 6.18 where Paul said, Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. And, I, you know, I think we can do that in our lives because we know how much He loves us. And we know that His love is uh, always faithful and always caring. So let's think about how great our God is.
people this morning that you are a great God, that you are great in every sense of the word. We overuse that word, but God, you are magnificent and glorious and just more than we can imagine or think of. And you bring more favor and more grace and more mercy and more love into our lives than we could ever think of or imagine. And God, I just pray that everyone who can hear this, Lord, that they are just just excited to have you in their lives. And if not, that they can just ask you right now, God, I really, I believe that Jesus died for me and I just, I need you in my life, God. And Lord, I just pray that um, each of us would just be able to, to just call on his name throughout our week, throughout our days, that we would just live in the moment with him. We ask all this in Jesus' name. I'd like to ask our ushers to come forward so that we might present before the Lord his tithes and our offerings. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are our great God. Lord, we thank you that we have this opportunity to worship you, to bring our lives before you, our hearts. You see us, Lord, exactly who we are. And Lord, uh, this is our chance to give, our chance to give back to you. And Lord, just a small way. And we have been blessed so greatly. We thank you for that. Lord, may you take this gift and use it for your kingdom to glorify yourself. Bring honor to your name. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Before I read scripture, just wanted to give a few brief announcements. Number one, I did want to let everyone know if they didn't see their email last night that our oldest living member of our church passed away yesterday. Miss Elsie Wiggins passed. Um, and we are obviously deeply saddened by that. We don't have any uh, details of the uh, funeral arrangements, but uh, it will obviously happen this week. And we will keep you abreast of that. But please pray for Arlene and Earl. And, and uh, if you know them, you know that's her two siblings. I mean, excuse me, her two children. And uh, ask you to continue to be in, in prayer for that family. Secondly, we will have a men's group that will be starting tomorrow night. I invite any men who would like to be a part of that. A men's group will be a Bible study, prayer. Uh, being able to connect together. That'll be at 6.30 here at the church. We'd love to have any of the men that are interested in that. And also next Sunday, we'll be starting a new class, which will be at 9 o'clock in the morning, on, on a Sunday morning from 9 to uh, 10.15. And this will be on the Bible's most difficult topics. In, uh, or actually, I should say, a lot of the culture's most difficult topics, which confront Christians today, talking about doubt, why is there evil in the world, uh, some of the cultural aspect, homosexuality, transgenderism, all of these things we'll be talking about from a biblical perspective. That'll be next Sunday at 9 o'clock. Now, let's, uh, let's look into God's Word. John 2, verses 1 through 12. If you have your Bibles or if you have your phones and just want to look real quickly. John 2, 1 through 12. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. And when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six 
stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 10, from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, so they filled them to the brim. And then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best till now. This, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's pray before we approach God's word. Father, today is the day you've made. And Joseph, pray, Lord, for your word. And Lord, as we look into your word today, may you use it to speak into our hearts, speak into our lives. And Lord, we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, I'd like to start my message by doing something that, if you've attended church, it's a bit unusual for a typical sermon, and that is, I'm going to take attendance. Now, you know how it works. A teacher or a coach or a wife will call out your name, and how do you answer? Here. But rather than call out everyone's individual name, uh, I will call out, if you will, I'm going to call out Garner Avenue Christian Church, and if you'd humor me, would you simply say, here. So here we go. Garner Advent Christian Church. Here. Yeah. Here. Very good. Thank you. So the good news is this. That right here, right now, you're here. All right? That's the good news. But the bad news is that some of you won't be here for long. You'll still be here physically. But mentally, your attention will go somewhere else. For example, maybe you receive a text message in the middle of the service and you just can't help but be distracted by that and, and look to that. Or, God forbid, you'll initiate a text and God will strike you from, with a lightning bolt from heaven. Or maybe your mind will drift to your honey-do list or the fight you had with your spouse last night or the nap you enjoyed this afternoon. <clears throat> I'm so glad you're here right now in this time, but some of you won't be here for long. Now, I just read the, the story of Jesus' first miracle. We all know that Jesus saves, right? But were you aware that his first saving act was to save a wedding? He did. He turned water into wine when the wedding host ran out of wine, which is a huge problem when you realize that the typical ancient Jewish wedding lasted for a week. And so, that was a problem. But we know that Jesus stepped in, he turned the water into wine, and in the story's climax, the wedding caterer pulled the bridegroom aside and said, everyone typically brings out their best wine first, and the cheap stuff comes out after everyone else has had too much to drink. But you save the best till when? Now. You save the best till now. And that is the title of my message this morning. Your best days are when? Now. Now, right here, right now, in this present moment. So today I want to talk about a quality that Jesus exemplified in his life that we can all emulate, and the best news is that we don't have to be deity to practice it. We can all do it. And what was that quality? Jesus was, Jesus was always present in the moment. Do you realize that? No matter what he was doing or who he was interacting with, he was able to be fully engaged. He experienced an undivided attention of the moment. Now, I'd like to share two biblical stories which illustrate this critical quality. In Luke chapter 18, Jesus is appearing, uh, excuse me, he's approaching Jericho with his entourage of 12 of his personal disciples 
and a massive crowd which is following him. Now picture that scene in your mind. You have hundreds of people that are engaging in uh, conversation simultaneously, so you know what that noise is like. Picture kids running and yelling and screaming and laughing and people clamoring for Jesus' attention and the disciples playing the role of bouncers. Hey, you, back off, Jesus. Give him some room. And in the middle of all of this commotion, Jesus walks by a blind beggar. And the beggar starts screaming at the top of his lungs, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. And the disciples, they treat him just like my dad used to treat me when he put me to bed and he heard noise after he did that. My dad would say, I don't want to hear a peep out of you. Don't make me come up there. You ever heard that before? The disciples actually say to this blind beggar, shut up. Be quiet. Son of God has no time for you. And then we read this in verse 40. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. And when he came near, Jesus asked him, he asked him, Lord, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see. And immediately, Jesus healed him. So in the midst of, the, of all this noise and commotion of his life, Jesus was able to be fully present in the moment with a blind beggar. Now, now the second story immediately follows after the healing of the blind beggar. We read in Luke 19, 1, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. The Bible tells us, also tells us that he was short. You could say that he was the Danny DeVito of the ancient Mideast. But being short was the least of his problems. Because he also happened to be one of the most hated men in Jericho because he made his living scamming his own countrymen on their income taxes being paid to their mortal enemy, Rome. If I was Zacchaeus, I would have never left the house. But something drives this, this rich, corrupt executive to do something very undignified. He climbs a tree. He literally climbs a tree. Now, how many of you have ever sang that song, We Little Man, in, in Sunday school, back in the day, the We Little Man Zacchaeus? So he climbs a tree to get a glimpse of Jesus over the massive crowd, still following Jesus. And then we read in verse 5 of Luke chapter 19, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Now, it's one thing to be in the present moment to make time for a blind beggar, but to invite yourself to lunch with a scumbag at Jericho, that's a whole other deal. But Jesus gives him his undivided attention, and while he's talking with Zacchaeus over lunch, Zacchaeus experiences a moment of deep repentance. And he says to Jesus, Lord, I vow to give half my possessions to the poor. And I'll pay back four times the amount to anyone I cheated. And Jesus looks at this deeply flawed man and he says to him, in verse 9, quote, Today, in this moment right now, salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. Once again, Jesus fully present fully engaged in the moment. And thus he's able to stop and offer his attention and his love to someone who desperately needed it. Now, let's turn it to us. I confess, and maybe you can as well, that the Jesus I've just described for you, that can be a challenge for us. It can be a challenge for me. Are you still here, everyone? Still here, right? Here, good. Harvard University did an interesting study recently, and I wanted to share it with you. They discovered in this study, 
in their exact words, and I think I have it, 47% of the time, people's minds are not at the same place where their feet are. Just look at that. What does that mean? It means that 47% of the time, you can engage in a conversation with someone at church, and meanwhile you're thinking, where am I gonna go to lunch today? Carolina barbecue or Zaxby's? <laughs> it means that 47% of the time, your spouse can be sharing the details of their day, and you're thinking, tonight I'm gonna to binge watch the first season of Jack Reacher on TV. Sorry, Kevin. 47% of the time, it means that 47% of the time you can come across people desperate for a touch from Jesus, but you walk right on by because your mind is a thousand miles away. Oh, I need to pick up some milk and eggs and get to the bank before it closes. The point is, is that almost half of our waking lives, our minds are not fully engaged where the rest of our bodies are. Let me share another humbling statistic which proves how often we struggle to fully engage in the present moment of our lives. This is going to hurt for some of us. The average cell phone user touches their phone 2,617 times a day. That's average. That's a lot of times where you and I are not engaged in the moment. Can we agree to that? Whatever is in front of us isn't it as important as a cat video or an hilarious political meme or seeing how many posts, see me how many likes our posts received. Are you still here? You're here. Sure. Good, great, you're still here. But let's delve even deeper into our disengaged minds because I believe that there's two mind games that we all play that keep us from being fully engaged in the moment. Are you ready? Here's the first one. Do you play the when-then game? The when-then game. Sounds like this. One day when I'm finally able to leave home and start my own life, then I'll be happy. Or one day when I get a real job, then I can buy that house. One day, when my kids are finally out of diapers, then I can give my life back. Or one day when I'm just about ready for diapers myself, then I'll retire and enjoy life. Here's the question. How many of us go through life wishing away our current moments? Wishing away what is right in front of us. How many of us do that? But you know what the truth is about it? One day, I promise you, you'll miss the very moments you wished away. You'll sit in, possibly sit in an empty house and say, what I wouldn't give to hear kids running crazy through the house again. The one that game. There's a second mind game that we play. We all play it. And we could call this the what if game. What if? We project into the future. What if we can't afford braces? What if gas reaches five dollars a gallon? What if dad needs to be placed in a nursing home? What if it is cancer? On and on and on. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 6, 34, and you know this verse, many of you, therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Jesus isn't against planning for the future, but he's telling us not to, not to overwhelm ourselves and worrying about the future. And I don't know about you, but I'm guilty as charged. So I ask you again, are you still here? Here. Yeah. Right. Because it's really important that we be in the presently engaged in the moment. So, 
We've isolated the problem. How do we become more fully engaged in the moment? How do we do that as followers of Christ? Well, it starts with a basic understanding. Let's look at it together. James 4, verses 13 through 14. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. God says, look, you might have your life all figured out. At least you think you do. But let's be truthful about this. You don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. Never mind a year from now. And that's not all that God says. He says, you must understand that your life is what? It's only a mist. It's a mist. I said, I, I, I started, when I wrote this, I said, I, I've got to give them something to really connect with. Okay, so let's, let's connect together. What God is saying is, look, this is your life. Are you ready? That's your life. That's my life. You say, well, I'm going to live to be 100. Fantastic. I love your optimism. I really do. So let's say you live to be 100. This is your life. Either way, you kind of, it's still a mess, isn't it? It's here today, gone tomorrow. The, year, the years slip by. You understand that. We all know that. And do you know who controls the spray can? God. Right? It's not me. It's not you. It's God. So we know this, that every single day is a gift from God. And some of us are wishing it away. And therefore, God wants to remind you of something just as important as remembering that your life is a mist. <clears throat> Let's look at it together. Psalm 118, 24. This is the day. Today is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Today is God's day. It's the day that he's made. So I am going to be fully engaged in this day. The most important moment is right now. The most important person is right in front of you now. And I don't know about you, but I can tend to live for tomorrow. I live for the big moments, the, the powerful moments. But you know what I've come to realize? The most powerful moments are oftentimes the smallest moments. Today, Kim and I, for instance, are empty nesters. And years, years ago, our two sons spread their wings and they flew from their protective nest our family. And so when they, when they both branched out, I had a chance to be together with them one day. I'll never forget this. And I said, Keith, Kelly, I gotta ask you a question. Now that you guys are moving on your own, tell, tell, you, tell Dad, what's, what's the favorite thing that we ever did as a family? What do you think? Tell me, I really want to know. And I was waiting to hear Oh, Disney World. Oh, when we went as a family to Disney World, nothing could top that. Or when we went camping, or when we did some kind of trip, or, or grandma, grand, granddad. I, I expected to hear that. But what I didn't expect to hear was this. Oh, Dad, that's easy. They both agreed. Really? What was, the, what was your favorite time? The 16-hour car rides from Illinois to Massachusetts, and from Massachusetts to Illinois. How does a 16-hour car ride top Disney World? Was my question. Would that be your question as well? But then I figured it out. I figured it out. You know what it was? What they were saying to me, they didn't use these exact words, was 
This is one of the few times that we're all fully present in the moment, together, engaged together as a family. It never happened like that. But we had 16 hours together. And thus, that was their favorite time, the thing they'll most remember. And my thought was after that, boy, I could have saved a lot of money and taking them to Disney World. I could have said, hey guys, let's just get in the car. We're going to go for a long ride. It's only going to cost us gas. Are you tracking with me here? I know you are. Please don't miss what you have now, right now. This is the day the Lord has made. And when you look at Jesus, it was the way he lived. There's no doubt about it. As he walked along and he was always in the midst of some kind of commotion, something going on, but he was able to be fully engaged. The people were not interruptions or inconveniences. There were moments to be able to engage and show the love of God. Now, when you think about Jesus, if there was ever a time where he could have been distracted, where his mind could have been a thousand miles away, where would that one time have been? On the cross. But you know what the Bible tells us? That while he was dying on the cross, in, in just pain and agony, trying to keep from being suffocated, which is the way he died, keeping himself up, pushing against the nails, as the, all of our sins were heaped upon his shoulders, he engaged in a conversation with a thief. This thief was like Zacchaeus. He knew his sin. He even talked about it with the other, the other person dying on the other side of Jesus. And he turned to Jesus at one point and he said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what was Jesus' response? Today, today I tell you, you will be in the kingdom of God. Today, you will be with me in paradise, is the exact words he used. Fully engaged in the moment. Friends, I don't know who this message is for, but I do know this. If your mind isn't where your body is 47% of the time, you're missing out on the life that God has given you. You can't be a great friend if you're not there. You can't be an engaged parent if you're not there. You can't have a great marriage if you're not there. You can't experience any of these things until you recognize this is the day that the Lord has made. Because of that, I will rejoice and be glad in it. Rick Ezel tells a story of a university professor who was invited to speak at a military base. And a soldier by the name of Ralph was assigned to pick up the professor at the airport. And after they met and introduced themselves, they headed towards the baggage claim. <coughs> However, as they walked along the concourse, Ralph kept stopping. He kept stopping. Once to help an older woman whose suitcase had fallen open, the next time he stopped for toddlers just to lift them up on his shoulders so that they could see Santa Claus, he was there. And lastly, to give directions to someone who was, who was lost. And each time, Ralph came back with a huge smile on his face. And the professor asked, where did you learn to do that? Do what, Ralph asked. To be so helpful and considerate to others. Oh, Ralph said. It was during the war, I guess. And then he told the professor about his tour of active duty and his job of clearing minefields. And he said, I watched friends get blown up before my very eyes, and I never knew whether the next step would be my last, 
So I learned to get everything I could out of a moment between when I picked up my foot and when I put it down again. And every step I took was a whole new world, and I've just been that way ever since. A grace-filled love is living between the steps. It understands the remarkable gift of today. So your best day, your best life is when? Now. Now. Now is the moment you can experience God's grace. Now is the moment you can experience his mercy, his love, his forgiveness. Now, right now, his power is here. And in this holy moment, God is with us now. And I believe God has led me to tell you that your best days are now. Engage in this moment. Be where your feet are and see what God has put in front of you. Let's pray together. Father, I have to say, I have to confess, the reason I believe you gave me this message is, first of all, you wanted to speak it into my heart. Because, Lord, I confess that there's a lot of times where I'm not fully here. Maybe I'm worried about the future. Maybe I'm playing the, the when-then game. Maybe I'm playing the what-if game. Maybe I'm just consumed with my cell phone. Lord, it's so easy to be distracted and in our distraction to miss the present moment to not be fully engaged with people. And some of these are people that we love dearly. So we can say, Lord, that we're missing life. Lord, I pray that we could all say in this room that we, I want to be like Jesus. No matter what's happening, what my surroundings are, who I'm interacting with, <coughs> And I'm fully there. And I'm ready to engage. I'm ready to give love, share love. I'm ready to share my presence. And maybe I'm even ready to share the good news of the gospel. But Lord, I pray that we, that might be our prayer, each and every one of us today. Because our best days are now. In your name we pray, Lord. Amen. Um, I, I thought of a song. It's pretty obvious. Um, this is the day that the Lord has made. And I thought, you know, why don't we sing that together and be reminded this whole week and have this tune in our head. You know, this is the day the Lord has made. Whatever day it is, that's the day. So I think you all probably know this one. It's pretty much the same thing over and over again. This is the day, this is the day. Thank you. 
spoke to my heart so much this week as I put this together that it was not just for me, it was for, for many of you. And that you're struggling to be present. Yes. And that you need to come to the Lord and say, Lord, this is where I'm at. I need to be fully engaged. I want to, I want to be like you. And if that's you, and if you need to come to pray, please come to this altar. This is what this is. This is an altar. This is a place for people to come and do business with God in prayer. I invite you, I invite you to come right now. Jesus, our Savior, we 